So a couple of years ago, my family and I, we were flying out of San Diego, and we got to the airport, and the airport was super crowded that day. And in, in fact, we, we get in the security line, and the line is just, you know how they have the stanchions that go back and forth and back and forth? They're all full, and the line is like spilling out into the terminal. And it was right after they had installed those new full-body scanners, you know, where you stand to the side and put your hands up and all that, but, but they, they had three of those in front of security, but they only had one of them running. So part of the reason this line was so long is that everything's bottlenecking in this, in this one group that has to go through, through this uh, body scanner. So, you know, everybody, as we all do at the airport when we're waiting, we're like, you know, I'm checking our watch, and now are we going to miss the flight? And everybody's kind of getting stressful, but, you know, waiting is kind of part of life. But, uh, but the guy in front of me, he's like taking it to a whole new level, right? He's hands on the hips, crossed and uncrossed the arms, and just <sighs> sighing as loudly as possible. So we can all understand, but maybe we're inconvenienced, but not as much as him. So this one scanner's open, the other two are closed, and he starts getting mouthy with the TSA agents. <laughs> Always a good strategy. And he says, uh, hey, hey, don't you see uh, this long line here? How about, how about you guys open up those other two machines? They, you know, they're focusing on the passengers, and then, you know, maybe, maybe a minute goes by, and he's like, hey, hey, seems like a lot of you guys are standing around doing nothing. Why don't you guys open up those other two machines? We get this line moving a little bit, right? And he starts that thing where he's looking around, you know, waiting for all of us to be like, yeah, you tell him. And we're like, I'm, I'm, mm -mm. <laughs> right? So, so finally, he just gets to the point where he's just, he's had it. So he goes, hey. Hey, the taxpayers pay your salary, so I'm kind of your boss. Why, why don't you go ahead and open up those additional two lines, buddy? And at that point, the TSA agent looks up and looks at the guy, right, to figure out, oh, who's, who's the guy who's getting a little lippy? And it dawns on me because I'm standing next to the guy <laughs> who then turns and looks to me as if I'm supposed to be like, yeah, or give him a fist bump or whatever. The TSA agent looks at that guy and then looks at me like I'm with him. And I'm like, I'm not with Osama been complaining over here. He's on his own. And in that moment, for me, it was like, you know what? I, I don't want any part of his negativity. Because the bottom line is that in life, there are few things less attractive and less appealing than anger and negativity. And there's a reason that I, I bring that up because I really feel like we have a problem when we talk with people about Jesus. And that is that, that we, the big church, I don't, I don't mean locally East Lake, I mean the big church of Christians in the world today, we have a perception problem. And the perception problem is, you know, we're, we're kind of negative. We're kind of negative and it makes it hard for people to hear us when we talk about Jesus. And I think it, it, it closes down relationships and it, and it builds walls. So we're finishing up this Essence series this weekend, and we've been looking at these crucial elements of the Christian faith. In week one, we talked about this notion that we're not sinners who sometimes get things right. We're saints who sometimes get things wrong. In the second week, we talked about being complete in Jesus, this notion that Jesus plus nothing is everything. And last week, we were talking about the, the righteousness of Jesus. Basically, being right with God, it's a gift. It's not something that we earn. And once we do that, our, our lives are really hidden in Christ. And in this week, the fourth week, the final week, I want to look at a passage in, in the book of Colossians that really talks about an additional essential element of the Christian faith. Now, I want, I want to talk about what Colossians is just in case you're going like, eh, I'm, I'm new to this series, hey, I'm, I'm new today, or I don't really know a lot about the Bible, like, I hear these words, what does that mean? Well, Colossians, it's basically, it's a book in the Bible that's a letter that was written by a guy named Paul. And if you, if you grew up in church, you might have heard of him referred to as the Apostle Paul. If you grew up Catholic like me, you've heard him referred to as St. Paul. And he wrote this letter to a group of believers in a, in a place called Colossae. And he was basically telling them, look, this is what it means to follow Jesus. This is what's involved in following Jesus. And it's important for us to understand that the people he was writing to in this place called Colossae, uh, they weren't like in this town where everybody believed all the same stuff. In fact, Colossae was very diverse in terms of the religious belief 
that was held by the people there. You had certainly the, the, the Jewish people who held to the traditional Jewish customs and faith, and then you had a, a group of people called the Gnostics. I don't, I don't have time to get into what Gnosticism is, but it's, it's, a, it's sort of a separate faith, very different from what, what Christians or, or the Jewish people would believe. And then, believe it or not, there was sort of like this angel cult group that was there as well. And then there was another group that was the Christians. So there's this diversity of belief in this town, and Paul is writing to these people about, hey, here's how you do life as a Jesus follower in this diverse environment. And here's what he wrote in chapter 4. It's really interesting. He wrote this, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. See, Paul is giving the people of Colossae this basic how-to of interacting with people who don't necessarily believe the same stuff as the Christians do. And in, in doing this, he's giving you and me this fourth essential element of what it means to follow Jesus. And it's this, this big idea, and it's this. If you are in Christ, you are a witness. What Paul is saying to them in their day and us in our day is that we have a responsibility to live wisely among people who don't believe the same stuff that we do so that we can be witnesses on behalf of Jesus. Now, if you're here and you're somebody who, like, you know, you haven't signed on to follow Jesus, you're like, hey, I, you know, am I exempt this week? Well, relax, okay? Because if you haven't decided to follow Jesus, well, no one would expect you to go out there and talk about Jesus. But let me ask you this, let me ask you this. If you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, would you stay engaged in this talk? And here's why. Because I believe that you may have some misperceptions of the way Christians are going to interact with the world, and I would like to, if I can, and if you're willing, talk about some of those misconceptions and maybe, maybe pop some of those bubbles that you may, may believe about Christianity. Now, I use this word witness, that it's our responsibility as Jesus followers to be a witness, and I use the word witness for a reason, and that's this, a witness just has to talk about what they've seen and experienced. That's all a witness does. My, my friend Brett, he lives in Las Vegas, and he was sitting at his house one day, and his phone rings. So he answers the phone, and on the other end of the call, it's his friend and his neighbor who lives across the street. And his friend and neighbor goes, hey, Brett, um, I, I just got a notification. The alarm is going off at my house. I think somebody's breaking into my house. Can you go over and check? And Brett's like, well, did you call the police? And his friend's like, no, I'm going to call them right after I get off the phone with you. Can you go take a look first? Now, Brett is a former fighter pilot, which means that he's both really brave and also a little bit crazy. And I say that because there are a lot of aviators who go to this church, and you are all super brave and a little crazy. And we're, we're glad that you're on our team. But generally, if you fly planes for a living, you got a little extra dose of bravery. Because I'll tell you what, if I got that phone call and somebody was like, hey, you know, I want to call the police after you go check. I'm like, hey, I got an idea. How about we both call the police and I'll watch from the window? Because I'm not going across to see if your house is getting robbed, but not Brett. No, 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 no. He, like I said, he's brave. He gets out his phone and he starts filming it. And he walks across the street and sure enough, in front of the house, there's a Tahoe parked with the back open. And these guys are running out of the house because the alarm's going off and they, and they realize they're in trouble. And he's just filming the whole thing. And finally, the last guy comes out and he's the driver of the car. And he looks at Brett, who's filming the whole thing, and he's like, oh, yeah, this is, um, this is my friend's house. And Brett's like, no, it's not. That's my neighbor's house. And the guy gets in the car and like tears off down the street. Well, sure enough, the police find these guys, catch these guys, and the whole thing goes to trial. And Brett is called in as a witness. And so the, the prosecutor says to Brett, well, uh, can you identify the men that you saw that day? And he goes, yes, it's those criminals sitting right over there. And the defense attorney's like, hey, objection, you can't refer to them as criminals. He's like, oh, I'm really, I'm really sorry. Yeah, it's those guys right over there. And sure enough, they get convicted, they go to jail. But here's the important thing about Brett's role as a witness. It wasn't his job to be the prosecutor. It wasn't his job to convince everybody and argue with everybody that what he saw is true and right. What his job was, was simply to say, look, this is what I saw. This is, I know what I saw, and here's what I saw. All he had to do was tell what he had seen. And that's our job, to be a witness. 
That's really the extent of it. We don't have to argue with people. We don't have to belittle what other people believe. We just have to be honest about what we've seen and what we've experienced. So, so here's the challenge for you and me, and because it, it brings up a lot of questions, because a lot of us, me included, we, we can struggle with this. The first question is this, how can I live my life as a witness? It seems like a simple question, but it's actually kind of complex. If you've ever tried to talk with people about your faith, boy, it, it can really feel a little awkward sometimes. So, so how do you get it done? Well, the first step is very simple. It's this, be wise. Oh, you're thinking, be wise. Thanks, Captain Obvious. That doesn't really help me. That's not very practical. Be wise. How do I do that? Well, being wise simply means this, that you and I have to be thoughtful about how we do this. If I walk around with a bullhorn shouting at people about Jesus and telling them they're wrong and I'm right, you know what? I don't think that's going to win a lot of people over. We have to give consideration to how we come across to people. Why? Because it says so in Scripture. Check out what it says in 2 Corinthians. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. We're the pleasing aroma of Christ. Now, have you ever noticed how when people smell something really terrible, they, they suddenly have a desire to share it with other people? They're like, oh, this is disgusting. Smell this. I do this too. I'll be like cleaning out the fridge and like I'll find some like weird jar in the back corner that was behind some gray poupon or whatever and you don't know how long it's been in there and you pull it out and you open it up and there's like a civilization growing inside. I don't know why I do this, right? I'll go, I wonder if it's still good. Oh, no, it is not. I mean, it had a beard growing out of it and I'm like, I wonder if it's still good. And what do I do immediately? Every wife in the room knows what I do because every husband is just like me. I find my wife and I'm like, I found this in the fridge, smell this. And she's like, oh, that's terrible, right? Why do, we, why do we feel the need? It's bad, yet we share it. The flip side of this, my wife does this when she drags me shopping somewhere, right? She'll find a candle and it's got a cedar wick and it's like scented chamomile, lavender, spice, honey, chamomile, whatever. And she's like, oh, smell this, it's amazing. And I smell it and I'm like, yeah, it's good. It's good. I mean, it's not like motorcycle exhaust and bacon smelling good, but it's good. It's good. It smells all right. But the, the bottom line is like this notion of the pleasing aroma of Christ is aromas are actually something naturally. I don't know why. Humans, we like to share. And Scripture is saying we are that aroma. We're like the freshly baked cookie smell of Jesus floating in the world around us. And that should be appealing to people. And just like that very first scripture that we looked at from Colossians 4, it said we've got to make the most of these opportunities to be the pleasing aroma of Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean we have to go around and be happy and pretend we're happy all the time like we're Ned Flanders from The Simpsons. That's not what I'm saying. But we've got to be aware of the way that we come across to people because if we're just constantly interacting with the world like we just ate a lemon, I don't think that's going to be real friendly to people. My mom used to tell me my face would get stuck that way, so I'm going to stop doing that. A while ago... Our family was at, a, at, at this gathering, and there were a lot of different people that I didn't know, and they were from all over the place, and there were people who go to church, and there were people who don't go to church, and just, just a lot of people I'm, you know, getting to meet, and uh, the person who was hosting it asked a guy I know who's a Christian to say grace before the meal, and I, and I think a lot of people there were like, ooh, I've, I've heard about grace, I, I don't really know what that is, but okay, so the guy had the opportunity to pray in front of people, and so he said, oh, you know, let's, let's pray, <sighs> Lord. We're just so concerned about this bad old world. And things are just so terrible. And people are walking away from you. Amen. <laughs> and I was like, well, um, well, that wasn't really very uplifting. And, and I felt like I wanted to go to the other people who were there and be like, hey, uh, I'm a Christian too. And <laughs> Party rock is in the house tonight. Like, I want to do something to go like, you know, we're not all depressed. We're not all sad. Like, yeah, there's tough things in the world, but like, we're hopeful. Jesus is good news. And it was just, it was really, it was really uncomfortable in that moment. But we've, we've got to, to think about these things like, you're going to have opportunities. So it brings up this question, how can I make the most of every opportunity? Because sometimes it feels like we miss those opportunities. How can I make the most of every opportunity? Well, to be honest with you, you can't make every conversation about Jesus. And please don't, because you're going to creep people out. If you're in the grocery store and somebody comes up to you and you're just pushing your cart down the aisle and they go, hey, do you you know where I can find the bread? And you go, no. 
but I can tell you where to find the bread of life, and that is Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. And if you will come unto Him and repent of your sins, you can have a new life forever with Him in eternity right now. If you do that, they'll be like, wait a second, I'm just trying to find the sourdough, man, right? You can't take every opportunity and just bam with people about Jesus because you know what? They're, they're really not open to it in that moment. We've got to pick our spots. And when we do so, and there's a non-awkward opportunity to talk about faith, we need to be ready. That's our job. Just be ready. It's just as simple as that. We're going to have opportunities, and when we have them, we should be ready with a response. Take a look at this verse from 1 Peter. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. There's, there's two key elements to that verse, and I want to point out both of them. The first is this, and I want you to underline this. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks. It doesn't say, bludgeon everybody you meet with your opinion. It doesn't say that in Scripture. It says, be ready when people ask which suggests there's a conversation, there's a dialogue, it's a two-way street, there's some give and take, it's organic. For, for me, the practical application of this is that I try to make my conversations with people when I'm talking about issues of faith, I try to make it so they're not arguments about the existence of God. Because you know what arguments mean? I'm trying to win a debate. And if I win the debate, somebody else has to lose the debate and then they feel like they've lost. And you know what? When people lose, they're not real open to what I have to say. And I tell people what my experience has been, and if they ask me a question and I, and I don't know the answer to them, you know what I say? I don't know. I don't know. I think that's a big reason that a lot of us are intimidated in talking about faith because we're like, well, I, I don't know all this stuff about the Bible, and I, I don't really have all this knowledge, and you know, you know, I'm, I'm afraid they're going to ask me something I don't know. You know what you can say? I don't know. It's a perfectly acceptable answer. I learned this in parenting. It took me a while. But... For instance, if I have a conversation with somebody, they might ask me, this is, this is how a door might open to conversation about faith. Somebody might ask me this, and this has actually happened, where they're asking about a, a big decision I made in my life. Maybe it's when I decided to, to take a certain job or move to a new city or when I decided to get married or when my wife and I decided, decided to have kids. Like, those are big decisions. And they'll say, like, how, how did you know that you needed to take that step? And for me, I can't answer that without talking about Jesus. I can't. It would be dishonest for me to talk about that without talking about Jesus. So here's what I'd say. Well, the way I'm going to answer this, it, it might strike you as like a little like spiritual or cosmic or whatever, but, but honestly, here's what I do when I have to make a big decision is I, I kind of I take it to Jesus and I, and I say, Jesus, I'm trying to process through this and here's, here's what I think but I need your wisdom in the middle of this. And what's your will and what, what, is the, what is the best thing for me to do in light of what your plans are for me and for my family and, and for what we can do in this world? And then when I have that sense of peace that what I'm doing lines up with what he wants, you know what happens? I don't second guess my decision because I've, I've got a lot of peace about it because I feel like, you know, I'm in line with what God's telling me to do in my life. And that's, that's what I'll tell people. And you know what I find is sometimes that opens the door for more conversation about spiritual things and about Jesus, which is great because they'll go, okay, I don't even understand what it means when you talk about the will of God. How do you, how do you know the will of God? Well, that's a great thing to be able to talk about. But to be perfectly honest with you, sometimes they look at me like a third eye has grown out of my head and they think I'm weird for talking about this Jesus thing. And you know what I do at that point? I drop it. I drop it. I just go, okay, I told them the truth. And if they're not really feeling open to what I have to say beyond that, that's okay. The second element that I want to talk about, and I want, you to, I want you to circle this in the Scripture, it says this, do this with gentleness and respect. Circle those words, gentleness and respect, because it's really important. I, I want to be the first to say, I have not always done this well, and I still don't always do this well. I need to do better. But I think it's fair to say that we, as a church, and I don't, I don't just mean locally, I mean the wider church, we could stand to do a little better on this one. I don't know if any of you have heard, because it's kind of been off the radar, it's not been like a big thing in the news or whatever, but um, there's a uh, presidential election coming up soon, and it's, I'm sure most of you didn't know about that, but um, as we've gotten closer and closer to this election, I've gotten more and more afraid to go on Facebook, 
because I have friends who are like these super kind, thoughtful, awesome, rational people in real life. And on social media, they turn into crazy people. And I don't say they're crazy people because I disagree with what they're saying, because it's not like anybody who disagrees with me is crazy. No, these, they're on all sides of the political spectrum. It's crazy because they get like angry and filled with rage, and they're just making these accusations about this politician or that politician or whatever. And I'm like, whoa, slow down. Do, do you think about how this comes across to people? And I, I think we have to be careful about that. We, we talked about this in service a, a couple of weeks ago, that we've, we've got to be thinking through how this sort of fear manifests and, and how it affects people. I, I'm amazed by the number of friends I have on both sides of the political spectrum who will say, man, if my candidate doesn't win the election, I'm moving to Canada. And I think the people in Canada are like, whoa, slow down, eh? <laughs> I, you got your problems, work a moot down there. That's my best Canadian accent. It's, if you're from Canada, I, I apologize. That's really not very close to a Canadian accent. But this is really one of the reasons that we do church the way that we do here at Eastlake. I'm going to let you in on something that may surprise you. There are people of all different political viewpoints at this church, and I think that's awesome. We've got Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives. We've got people who are in the Green Party. We've got libertarians. We've got whatever political persuasion you would imagine. They all go to this church. And do you know why that is? Because we have an important value here, that disagreement doesn't equal hatred. There's a difference. It's okay for us to disagree about public policy. That's fine. Because just if you and I don't see something the same way in the civic sphere, that doesn't mean that I hate you. It means we, we disagree about something. Newsflash, my wife and I don't agree about politics. We debate politics all the time. It's not a prerequisite that my wife sees the world the same way I do politically for us to have a successful marriage. I actually like the fact that we can debate this stuff. And you know what? Crazy thing, I might be wrong. More often she's wrong, but I'm just saying. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Actually, the, the fact of the matter is there's a give and take. We can be wrong. But we've got to be careful because you know why? Those people who disagree with you the strongest about what you feel politically, I want to tell you something about those people. Jesus loves them very much. He loves them a lot. And he loves you too. See, our political viewpoint isn't a prerequisite for Jesus' love. As Anne Lamott once said, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. See, that's the danger we run. And I fear that we American Christians have become so fearful and so angry about the things we don't like in society, we've made many people who don't believe in Jesus, they honestly believe that some of the hallmarks of Christian faith are just anger and fear, that that's really kind of what we're all about. And that troubles me. And to push it further, yes, our country has really substantial issues, and we've got to resolve those issues. And we need to be engaged in those discussions. I am not advocating that you withdraw from the civic sphere, that you not have a political opinion, that you not engage. Far from it. I think it's our responsibility to be engaged, but I think it's our responsibility to be engaged with respect, with decency, with kindness. Because yes, we need to fix things, but if we are characterized by our complaining, we're going to have a big problem. The bottom line is this. Instead of telling God, oh, we've got all these big problems, we need to be saying problems, we have a very big God. And I think if we say that, the world is going to go, you know what, these are hopeful people. They maybe have an answer. The last question we have to ask is this, how can I share my story? See, if you and I are witnesses, all we're responsible for is sharing our story, saying what we've experienced, what we've seen. And just like my friend Brett in the story I told you earlier, we just have to go, well, this is what I saw. The thing is, a lot of us think we don't have a story, but every one of us does. Most of us don't think our story is amazing, but the bottom line is that your story might be meaningful to somebody else because even if it seems unremarkable on the surface, sharing your story allows somebody else to go, me too, me too, I experienced that. And even if you think like, man, I, the way I feel about things, the way I look at things, you know what, that, nobody else feels the same way. Well, I'm going to let you in a little secret. You're not that unique. We all bump into a lot of the same stuff. 
And so even if you think, man, I'm the only one who's ever struggled with this, you know what? You're not. And if you can share your story, there's somebody else out there who maybe struggled with the same thing who can go, man, I thought I was the only one. That's someone I can relate to. That's someone I can, I can talk to. And so the best way that we can share our story is simply this, be intentional. What does that mean? Well, it just means we give some consideration to how we talk about our faith with people and then take the opportunity to talk about faith when it comes up. The voice translation of the very first scripture that I reference phrases it this way, and I love this, make the most of every moment in every encounter. See, if you're open to this idea, God is going to use you in ways that are going to surprise you. I have certain relationships and certain environments that I actively seek out because they're places where I'm going to interact with people who are different from me, and they see the world differently than I do, and they believe different things than I do. Now, I want to be super clear about this. That's not 100% of my relationships because you know what? That's not healthy either. You need to also have relationships with people who can encourage you and strengthen you in your faith. There has to be a balance of this. But if it's only people who look at the world the same way that you do, you're missing out on an opportunity to reach out to people. You've got to cultivate these relationships with people who, who are a little bit different from you. And if you make an effort to consistently reach out, I, I think you're going to find you can, you can break down some walls and have some conversations about Jesus. You know, I, one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll tell you up front, if you, if you and I are friends on Facebook or social media or whatever, you might be surprised, like, hey, the pastor, he didn't... He didn't put a lot of spiritual stuff on Facebook. Why, why is that? Well, actually, there is a reason. Because a lot of my friends, they would be completely freaked out if I did that. It would be, like, really strange for them because, they, like, they know that I'm a pastor. They know that I'm a Christian. They know I have this faith. But we're friends, and we talk about other stuff. We talk about music, or we talk about our kids, or we talk about sports, or whatever. And their perspective is, you know, yeah, Kevin, he, he does the Jesus thing, and, and, and that's cool. But that's not really the stuff we talk about. And I'm okay with that. Because you know what, there may be a time where they go through a difficulty and they've got a question about my faith and because of the relationship that we have, I'll be ready to have that conversation because there's a trust that's been built up over time. A buddy of mine actually came to faith here at East Lake a number of years ago and uh, it, was, it, was really, it was really kind of a cool thing and a cool story. He uh, was a guy that I immediately hit it off with because we had similar tastes in music, and we actually have similar senses of humor, and uh, he was on the worship team. And so we played music together, and it was, just, it was just a blast. And he lived actually in the same complex that my wife and I had lived in at the time, and so we just got to be really good friends. And over the years, we'd hang out and whatever, and as some time went by, he kind of started drifting away from his faith. And he was kind of less involved and just you know, made it clear, like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'd do the, the Jesus thing anymore. And we stayed friends. And then, because of work, he actually moved to a different city. And you know, with, with the distancing from his faith and physically the distancing from, from living here in San Diego, it would have been easy for him to kind of fall off the radar. But you know what? We stayed friends. And he'd shoot me a text message, and, you know, I'd text him back, and we'd, we'd stay in touch that way. And if he came to town to visit his family, we'd get together and we'd just, you know, go out, get something to eat, catch up, share stories, whatever. And it was, it was really great. And in fact, uh, a, a couple of years ago, he, he actually contacted me. He had scored these awesome concert tickets up in LA and he flew out to San Diego and we drove up and we went to this concert together and we drove back and we're just laughing and telling stories the whole time. And it was great. But I'll admit, it, had, it pained me a little bit. My, my friend had walked away from, from his faith, but it didn't mean that we had to stop being friends. And earlier this year, I got a, a text message from him, and he was talking about going back to church and how he had sort of recommitted his life to Jesus. And man, I was, I was so happy to hear that about my friend. It, it made me so happy to see that, that he had done that. And, and, and through all of that, we'd, we'd maintained our, our friendship. And, and he asked me an interesting question, which was, he said, hey, Remember that song you wrote that we played on the worship team? Could you send me a recording of that? And it, it was a song that we had played on the worship team like over 10 years ago. And it was a song I wrote that, you know, that I guess it meant something to him. And, and you're thinking like, and I didn't, I didn't know you wrote a song that we played on the worship team. There's a reason for that. My, my career as a songwriter was about as successful as my career as an NBA power forward. But it was, you know, it was a song that meant something to him. And so, honestly, I forgot to send it to him. 
And he kept bugging me because he's my friend. And he felt comfortable bugging me like, hey, dude, come on, send me that thing, send me that thing. So finally, I was like, all right, leave me alone. Here it is. Here's the song. I finally found it and sent it to him. And a couple of weeks ago, he sent me a video. And the video was him playing an acoustic guitar and singing that song. And it was honestly one of the nicest gifts that anybody has ever given me. And the reason it was such a nice gift is that it, it really said something powerful to me, which is, hey, man, I'm, I'm back on board. And this song that connected us as friends is, is, is really deeply connected to, to, to this time of my faith. Man, that was an amazing thing for me to be able to experience. And, and I want to tell you up front, I should get 0% of the credit for him taking those steps of faith, 0%. 100% of the credit goes to the Holy Spirit working on him. But I'll tell you this, I had the privilege of having a front row seat to see it happen. And that's amazing that God gives us this opportunity to just sit in the front row and watch what he's doing in people's lives if we're engaged in relationships with them. So I think what we've got to do is to seize these opportunities to be wise, to be ready, to be intentional so that people who feel like they're far from God will know that there's a God who loves them right where they are and can meet them there. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take out that connection card. I want you to look at the left side. And it says, this week I will. What can you do this week that connects to this idea of being a witness? Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. If, if you're here and you're a Jesus follower, who are you in a relationship with that you're tempted to just kind of disengage with? Now, important clarification. If the relationship is abusive, damaging, unhealthy, you need to go ahead and disengage, right? Separate sermon, but go ahead and disengage from abusive, damage, damaging, unhealthy relationships. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the person who's just kind of, they're right on the edge of your radar screen, and for whatever reason, circumstances of life, they're, they're kind of falling off. What can you do this week to reach out to that person? Send a text message. Give them a call. Just say, hey, how you doing? Who's a person you're not necessarily in a relationship with that you could actually reach out to because they kind of just, they could use a friend? Who's that person? Or is there a person who was engaged in walking with Jesus that you know and they kind of fell away? They just kind of like unplugged from that. Is there a way that you could plug them back in? Is there a way that you could just reach out and be a friend to that person? Now, if you're not a Jesus follower, you're like, man, this is awesome. I'm off the hook. I have a challenge for you. And that's this. Would you be willing to stick around this place and be who you actually are? Here's what I mean. I don't want you to feel the pressure of like pretending to be something you're not at this church. If you have doubts, if you have questions, you're not sure about all, all this stuff, here's my challenge for you. Would you keep coming? Would you come back next week? Because we want to know you and be your friend just as you are. Next week, we're starting this brand new series and it is a great opportunity to invite somebody to join you for a service here. And you might, you might have this technique for inviting somebody to, to service, and you're like, hey, um, my church has services, you should go by, right? Do not do that, okay? That's awkward and unsuccessful. What you could say is, hey, you know, I, I think I probably mentioned, like, I, I go to this church on the weekends, and it's, it's kind of fun. Um, if you would want to come, um, hey, you could come with me, and I could even pick you up, and we could sit together, and then actually pick them up or meet them here. Don't have them go alone. Check their kids in to the kids' ministries, and then come and sit with them at the service so they're not sitting by themselves. And after the service, invite them to your friends at the church. And if your friends at the church are weird, after the service, do not invite them to meet your friends at the church. <laughs> but be a host to someone who is going, I'm, I'm not really sure how to do this. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit is asking you and asking me to be a witness, to be wise, to be ready, to be intentional, so that we can share our story with people who trust us enough to be open to what we're saying and ultimately open to what Jesus has for them in their lives. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I ask that you would open up doors for us, that we could, we could be wise and that we would be ready and we'd be intentional in all of these relationships to, to just talk about you to talk about you in a way that is respectful, but also is, is honest and straightforward, and that we could be that aroma of you, that, that, that people would sense your presence when they're around us and when they speak with us, 
so that we could reach them and let them know how very, very much you love them. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.